Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I am Jani and I am a second year OBGYN resident. Today we're going to be going back to OBGYN and medicine residency slash fellowship talk and we are going to be talking about fellowship. Fellowship is basically when you subspecialize within a specialty. So in my case, it would be subspecializing as an OBGYN. There are quite a few options on different things that I could subspecialize in. Today, I'm going to be going over with you why I would want to do a fellowship or why I don't want to do a fellowship. I am still at a point in my training where I am undecided and I don't have to make any decisions now, but within the next year, I have to fully decide if I want to do a fellowship or not. So without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So within this video, I am going to be covering a few things. One, we are going to be covering the different types of subspecialties, which ones I am or could be interested in, why I would want to do one, and why I would not want to do a fellowship. So those are the four components of this video. Let's go ahead and get started with the types of subspecialties. There are two different types of categories of subspecialties. They are the board certified ones, which are created by, not created, but they're they're monitored by ABOG, the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, and they have specific tests that you have to qualify in order to be board certified. The others are subspecialties that have taken rise with time. They are not necessarily regulated by the Board of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, and in addition to that, they don't require you to be board certified in order to uh, practice, and they don't require you to go through formal exams, just certifications to make sure that you have the required experience to practice that subspecialty. So going with ABOG certified subspecialties, we have maternal field medicine or perinatology, and these are the obstetrician gynecologists that deal with high-risk pregnancies. They deal with women who have either for maternal or fetal reasons, they need more close monitoring, they are higher risk for complications. This is mostly an obstetric subspecialty. They are the ones that do most of the ultrasounds. They are Most of them are ultrasound experts. They do the anatomy scans, they look for anomalies, and they do all of that good stuff. In addition to that, they also do high-risk procedures like amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling, which are procedures that we can use to diagnose different types of anomalies in babies, like chromosomal abnormalities, trisomies, conditions that wouldn't be compatible with life, etc, etc. Then we have REI or reproductive endocrinology and infertility. This is another really interesting specialty. They are specialists in infertility, so they are the ones that do IVF, they do egg retrievals, they do inseminations, they do all of that. They also take care of patients who have endocrinological disorders or disorders with their hormones. So they see a lot of patients with PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome, they see a lot of patients with endometriosis, they see patients with congenital genital adrenal hyperplasia and a lot of other endocrinological disorders that can affect their reproductive life. In addition to that, we also have gynecology oncology. This is a specialty that deals with gynecological cancers. So they are the ones that specialize in cervical, ovarian, endometrial cancers. They do their most invasive and most badass surgery that you can imagine. They are trained to do intestinal surgery, bladder surgery, ureteral surgery, and deal with a lot of complications that comes with doing very high risk surgery in cancer patients. Then we have urogynecology, and these are the specialists of the bladder and the pelvic floor. They deal with all the patients that have incontinence, they have surgical complications with their bladder, they have third and fourth degree lacerations from their deliveries, and any kind of of other disorders of the pelvic floor or the uh, urinary tract in women. Then we have the newest subspecialty to be board certified, pediatric and adolescent gynecology. These are providers that specialize in seeing children and preteens and teenagers with different types of disorders from menstrual irregularities to genital adrenal hyperplasia.
dysplasia, they've never, they look like girls and they've never had a period or they don't have a vagina, they don't have other reproductive organs, things like that. They see all of these patients and then refer them appropriately to the other specialties that can help these patients. Those are the main board certified subspecialties. Most of them are very competitive and they require three to four years of additional training. For peds and adolescent, I believe it's two to three years of training depending on which program you go to. Then we go on to subspecialties that don't have a board certified test and those are minimally invasive gynecological surgery. So these are the specialists, the surgical specialists in OBGYN. They deal with very complicated surgeries. They do a lot of robot hysteroscopies. They do laparoscopic surgery. They deal with patients who have a lot of adhesions. They have endometriosis, pelvic pain, and those kinds of patients. Then we have family planning, which are the specialists of contraceptive and abortion care. So these providers specialize in providing birth control to patients. They work with Planned Parenthood and other organizations. They have high degree of training in terms of providing abortions and other termination services. They are really, really needed specialists and they provide one of the most amazing cares that we can for women and that is providing safe and accessible abortion services. And then we have the OBGYN hospitalists which are basically providers that work in labor and delivery for the most part. Some of them still do clinic. They provide care for women who are in the hospital. They do mostly obstetrics with a little bit of GYN surgery, mostly in emergent cases like ovarian torsion, ectopic pregnancies, and these kinds of procedures. That is it for the types of subspecialties that we have and which ones are board certified and which ones are not. A lot of these are in the process of coming board certified special subspecialties and in the coming years they will be coming out with more testing and increased requirements, stricter uh, criteria for programs providing these fellowships. Which subspecialties would I be interested in? So it only comes down to three of them. Two of them are board certified subspecialties which are MFM and REI. So MFM, I, you guys, if you haven't been able to tell, I I love obstetrics. I love pregnant patients. They make my day at work so much better. I love being on labor and delivery. I love taking care of them. I love doing ultrasounds and I love providing care for these patients. So MFM is a subspecialty that I have considered in the past. The only issue that I have with the specialty is that most available positions for this type of work is doing ultrasounds and one of the reasons I went into OBGYN and you can look at my video talking about why I went into OBGYN is that I love the unpredictability of my day even on labor and delivery. One day you can have a very slow day and the next day you can have no breaks and have a billion deliveries and be running from one side of the unit to the other. Whereas as an MFM most of your time will be spent either running an L&D unit or doing ultrasounds in the office and consults for high risk patients. So I don't know if I am okay doing this every day for the rest of my life basically. I don't know if I want to lose that spontaneity. It really makes me really passionate about my job. As for REI, I am not sure I would enjoy the fellowship training as much. There is a lot of bench work involved. There is a lot of lab work involved and I don't know if that is something that will continue to inspire me every day for the rest of my life. Even though it is something that I'm very passionate about, which is infertility care, I don't know if I want to do all the extra stuff that comes with being an REI versus I can still provide some degree of inf infertility care as a general. Then the other subspecialty that I could consider is hospitalist and this is what I am leaning the most towards right now and it's because there is more flexibility in the schedule. It allows me to spend more time with my family. It allows me to have more time to do other things aside of work and medicine.
in and really enjoy be able to enjoy life to the fullest. The thing is, to be a hospitalist, you can either go through a fellowship program that is one to two years where you get extra training, get your boards, and become a proficient provider by yourself. Or you can work as a generalist for three to five years, gain that experience, get your boards squared out, and then you can go and work as a hospitalist. This is what I'm leaning the most towards at this point, which would be working as a generalist for a few years and then maybe transitioning over to more of a hospitalist kind of work. So going into the reason why I would do fellowship, it would be because I really like those three subspecialties that I talked about. Most of them would pretty much like a pay bump. They would make me a more specialized provider, more focused, and narrow my, my practice from something very broad like a generalist that I see a little bit of everything into a more focused population, whether it be more infertility patients, early pregnancy, prenatal care for high-risk patients, and ultrasounds. Some of the reasons why I wouldn't do this, and these right now outweigh all of the reasons why I would want to do a fellowship, is the fact that it's more years of training, so that means two to three more years of getting paid like a resident, so a lot less than like an, as an attending physician. It would be two to three more years of basically being in a hierarchical work, work environment where I have to report to those higher above me and not have as much independence or liber liberty as a generalist physician where I would be my own boss and I would work with my colleagues to improve my skills and become more proficient and efficient in my work. Other reasons would be I have been very stressed out as a resident and there are aspects of being a resident that I don't particularly enjoy. So the idea of continuing on that aspect would be very stressful to add two to three more years of that pressure and that stress unnecessarily when I could be just as happy working as a generalist and working towards my goal of eventually being a hospitalist through that path. I also like the idea of having a more broad practice. There are aspects of being a generalist that I really still enjoy, which is that spontaneity, that uncertainty, seeing a different patient every day. And my day is not going to be one routine day where I see all of the same things all day long versus I could do an annual, I could see a pregnant patient, I could do a colposcopy. There's so many other things that I could do on my day to day as a generalist that I wouldn't be able to do as a subspecialist. That brings me to almost the end of this video and it is my closing thoughts. Like I mentioned in the beginning, I am still at a point where I am very undecided. My desires vary day by day. Some days I am really happy with the idea of being a generalist and or a hospitalist and then other days I would really like to learn more about fertility or infertility, about in vitro and all of these procedures. I I would like to learn more about ultrasound and caring for high-risk patients. I don't know, I am very undecided at this point. I still have not made a decision and you guys will know for sure when I do. If I end up being a generalist, I might be applying for jobs in the near future. And if I do, I promise to take you guys along that journey with me. So let me know your thoughts. Tell me what you think I could like. Tell me pros and cons that you see to each of those alternatives and I'll be sure to reply to your comments and give you my thoughts. Thank you so much for watching. Please give this video a big thumbs up if you do enjoy it. Subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a new video. And follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, social media in general so that you can be up to date on everything that I am doing. Again, thank you guys so much for watching. I love each and every one of you and I will see you all in my next video. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.